In 2014, Americans got more books from one place than anywhere else. Can you guess where that is? I'm going to tell you a secret. It's not Amazon. More than two billion books were put into the hands of the reading public by a library. Libraries outperforming Amazon, that's not the image that most of us have of libraries today. Many of us still think of libraries as being a quaint, middle-class institution that in an age of technology has passed its due date. The idea that libraries could actually be on the rise is curiously counterintuitive. Technology has changed forever the way that we find information and the way that libraries provide it. The media often loves to portray libraries as being in their final throes. And libraries themselves find their budget squeezed tighter and tighter every year against a wave of rising costs. And yet, libraries find themselves busier than ever. Why is that? Why is it that 50 million people find their way through the front door of a public library in New Zealand, physically or virtually, every year? The libraries of our childhood form a powerful idea in our minds about what libraries are. My childhood library was a Palmerston North Council building. And it was grey and minimalist, and inside it was filled with high shelves, serious adults, and books. Rows and rows and rows of books, dusty, yellowing, dog-eared. The Mills and Boone had all been defaced with the initials of the people that had read them. And it was silent. Except for the occasional thump of a due date stamp. Many of us remember this library. We recognise it and we love it. But this library, this library of nothing but books and silence, is a lie. It's a myth of a previous time. And that myth gets in the way of us realising an important truth. That our world needs libraries more than ever. And I use the word need deliberately. In an age of technology and information and growing inequality and social isolation, our world needs libraries. They're essential, like roads, like education, like hospitals. Why do we need them so much? Let's start with something that many of us probably take for granted, something that you might literally have in your hand right now, the internet. The internet has become more than just a nice to have. In the 21st century, without access to the internet, you are effectively silenced. You do not have a voice. You don't have freedom of speech, and you don't have freedom of access to information. One in five children in New Zealand don't have access to the internet in their home, and we don't care about that because they don't have Facebook or Snapchat or Clash of Clans. We care about that because without access to the internet and the development of some of those basic digital literacy skills, the ability of those kids to go on and participate in society decreases dramatically. In order to apply for even the most basic job today, you need to have an email address and an electronic CV. How do you do that if you don't have access to the internet or any digital literacy skills? How do you find out about government services or support mechanisms that might be available to you if you don't have a computer or a smartphone. Lots of organisations are moving services online and we generally think that that's a pretty good thing. But we can't ignore the fact that so many people don't have the access or the skills to get to those services. Last year, eight million internet sessions were provided by public libraries in New Zealand 
up 68% on the year before, and another 5.5 million Wi-Fi sessions. Public libraries in New Zealand provide access to the internet, and over 90% provide it for free. Up to June 2015, in the previous year, half a million people went to use the education sessions in a library. The ability of everyone to participate in society is made possible by libraries. But libraries are not just about technology. Libraries are also physical and social spaces. Anyone can go to a library. You don't need to buy anything. There's no expectation. You don't need to leave. Many of us don't think about libraries this way, but for some people, a librarian might be the only person that they talk to today. A library might be the way that someone who's unemployed or a new New Zealander overcomes a sense of social isolation. A visit to the library might be the only trip that a new parent or a retired couple can afford. Libraries are some of our few remaining public and social spaces. Our libraries are also a cultural refuge. We learn about our world and ourselves inside their walls. In the walls of the Alexander Turnbull Library, just a few kilometres away, there's a painting. And it's a painting of my great, 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 great grandfather. And the painting shows him and his brother Clearing Bush and Kandala in 1839. That painting provides me with a powerful link to my past and to my ancestors. And it makes me wonder. I wonder what they would make of the suburban jungle that sprung up. I wonder which house is on the clearing that they made. And I wonder what they would make of me. 180 years later, living just three kilometres down the road from where they were. It's this connection to our past that also makes libraries a target. In times of war, libraries are often the first places to be ransacked or burnt to the ground. That dislocation, that separation from our past, the erasure of history and evidence speaks to the power that a library has to hold our memory, to understand our present, and to look towards our future. In times of crisis, it's often the library that we turn to. Following the Christchurch earthquakes, as libraries reopened, they became places of familiarity and comfort. During the Wellington floods, it was the central library that opened its doors to anyone who needed a place to stay. Libraries can physically and spiritually shelter us. Why wouldn't we want to fight for that? Why wouldn't we want to fight for our right to remember and to know, to learn and to connect? It's very easy to take libraries for granted. The Port Nicholson Exchange and Public Library was the first library in New Zealand, built here in Wellington in 1841. But you don't need to look very far to see what can happen when the myth of libraries takes hold. Since 2010 in the United Kingdom, hundreds of libraries have been closed or had their budgets slashed following the global financial crisis. Just recently in Australia, the government announced $20 million worth of cuts to its national heritage institutions, including the National Library of Australia. And just a couple of years ago, I was interviewed on TV because a city councillor on the South Island thought that rather than have a public library service, perhaps we could just give everyone a Kindle. These kinds of stories are made possible by the persistent myth about what libraries are, those libraries we remember from our childhood, of nothing but books in silence. What will you do to give libraries a voice? What will you do to make sure that your public policy doesn't come from a Google search, that your diagnosis doesn't come from a Wikipedia page, that everyone has the right to participate in democracy? 
What will you do to smash that myth of libraries back into dust? Because libraries can and do change lives. A few years ago, I went into hospital for an operation and while I was there, I met a man and we got talking and he asked me what I did. I said, I'm a librarian. And he said to me, I have a real soft spot for librarians. <laughs> <laughs> and as a young boy, he had grown up in South Africa under apartheid. And because he wasn't white, his options and his access to education was limited. But every day, he would go into the library and the librarians would let him in and he would sit down at a table and they would give him things to read and he would read to his heart's content because those librarians cared more about his education and freedom of access to information than they did about rules on who was or wasn't allowed to be in the library. And that young boy became a doctor and that doctor has been educating the next generation of doctors for more than 20 years. When people lose touch with libraries, you'll often hear them say, nobody uses libraries anymore. So when you hear that, you can tell them. You can tell your chief executive, your vice chancellor, your school board, your city councillor. Who uses libraries? the child studying for their science fair project, the woman next to you at the bus stop who's looking for a job, the scientist researching a compound that might one day lead to a cure for Alzheimer's, the retired friends who meet together to read the newspapers, the researcher who works on the floor above you who's developing new public policy, the new parent and their baby taking their first steps into the world of literacy. The person next to you watching a TEDx talk. The teenager registering to vote for the first time. The new New Zealander keeping in touch with friends and family back home. Or perhaps the student studying to be a doctor who might one day save your life. Thank you.